But I want all of us to keep in mind as we um, talk about what's happening in the summer, early summer of 1964, just how nonlinear many of these conversations are. Lyndon Johnson will one moment be talking about uh, trying to uh, achieve peace between Greece and Turkey and Cyprus uh, in the period where the three civil rights workers are abducted and murdered in Mississippi. Uh, Johnson is also juggling all sorts of activity in Vietnam. Henry Cabot Lodge is out as ambassador. Maxwell Taylor is in. General William Westmoreland literally has just taken over control of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam uh, two days before uh, the civil rights disappearances. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount going on, and as Guillen said, also debates about the excise tax, the debt, ce the debt ceiling. Uh, so as you, you think about uh, Johnson, it would be easy to imagine that he's completely consumed by the disappearances of these three civil rights workers, uh, but he's having to multitask in an incredibly complicated uh, way. Uh, the Civil Rights Act um, has finally uh, made it through the Senate after a, a really brutal effort to, to break the Southern Bloc filibuster of 18 Southern Democrats and one Republican uh, who had attempted to, to block that. So the Civil Rights Act is headed towards final passage uh, and Lyndon Johnson will sign it um, about uh, nine or 10 days after the disappearance of the, of the Mississippi Three. Uh, for those who don't know as much about it, this is Freedom Summer. This was the Council of Federated Organizations, a group of umbrella organization of, of African-American-led civil rights groups um, seeking to um, effectively bring the law to Mississippi by bringing northern white and some African-American northern volunteers to Mississippi with the idea that their lives in some sense mattered more and that if there were acts of violence against those, they would draw the nation's eye to Mississippi. And tragically, uh, that did, did happen. Uh, it's also the summer that uh, by the end of the summer, Fannie Lou Hamer would be a household name. Uh, in, in a clip that, that's available on the website and that is in this volume, uh, you hear Senator James Eastland of Mississippi refer to that, quote, Negro woman from Ruleville uh, and essentially accuse her of being a bald-faced liar when she has testified that she's been shot at 19 times and he says uh, she's never been shot at a single time. Uh, uh, she's, she's a liar. Uh, and and uh, during this conversation that Lyndon Johnson has with Senator James Eastland, where he's attempting to ascertain what the white authorities in Mississippi know about the disappearances, uh, essentially Eastland says this whole thing has been cooked up as a publicity stunt. He has information that suggests uh, that in fact the civil rights workers uh, called about their disappearance before they had even gotten to their destination in Philadelphia. Uh, and so you see Eastland working very hard to suggest that again this is just uh, uh, a, a publicity stunt. And Eastland winds up mediating a call between himself and uh, Governor Paul Johnson Jr. of Mississippi. Lyndon Johnson really would prefer not to talk to the governor. Uh, and so Eastland calls, uh, and this is the same Paul Johnson Jr. Uh, who on the campaign trail referred to the NAACP as the N-word, alligators, apes, coons, and possums. Uh, denied widespread accounts of hunger in Mississippi by saying that, quote, all the Negro women that I see are so fat that they shine. So you really get a sense of, of deep-seated white supremacy on the part of Mississippi's white political leadership. Senator Eastland himself, uh, when confronted with evidence about the discriminating impact of the poll tax, uh, accused Virginia Durr, who was uh, advocating for the abolition of the poll tax some period before this. He said, I know what you all want. It's black men laying on you. So there's that poisonous nexus of sex and race and violence in Mississippi that despite Eastland's protestations, uh, it becomes very clear um, in a phone call from Lee White, Lyndon Johnson's close advisor. Um, he says, we, these civil rights workers have simply disappeared from the face of the earth. So the period of time that in just a moment, uh, Kent Germany will be talking about, Lyndon Johnson is wrestling with whether to communicate directly with the relatives of the missing three civil rights workers. And he really gives a lot of thought to the implications. If he starts meeting with the families of every civil rights martyr, what will that do? Uh, and reading through some of these transcripts and listening to the tapes, I don't think it shows Lyndon Johnson that is most attractive. He sounds a little bit like he's whining uh, when in fact we know the horror and the anguish that these families are going through.